Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I'm going to do the movie review that uh, I promised on the movie Risen. This is uh, the second movie review that I've done now. Um, I think a couple of years ago I did a, a review of the movie um, Son of God. Uh, matter of fact, I just reshared that uh, this morning or yesterday. Um, so I don't know if you've watched that, but uh, uh, I recommended that video. I thought it was uh, wonderful in a lot of ways, but uh, they, the, um, the, where they actually really failed was they, they never really uh, stated or even alluded to that the fact that Jesus' death on the cross was the reason that he was incarnate, that he, he came down from heaven, God came down from heaven, God was manifest in the flesh, um, God became a man, Jesus of Nazareth, for a purpose. He said, I came to give my life as a ransom. So the, the, his death on the cross was for the, that purpose. He willingly went to the cross, and that death on the cross served as propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, the scriptures tell us. So uh, that was the point of him dying on the cross, and he succeeded. His death on the cross uh, resolved the sin problem, uh, it provided reconciliation between God and mankind, uh, and, and that's where the movie The Son of God failed. They never uh, discussed that, which is um, like besides the fact that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, his death, burial, and resurrection, and, and uh, propitiation for our sins, this is the whole point of Jesus the Christ. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that movie was um, uh, excellent, except it failed in that critical way. Now the movie Risen, uh, I was, after I saw the movie Son of God, I was actually hoping that there would be some kind of a follow-up to it, uh, or, um, uh, and also the movie The Passion of the Christ, The Passion of Christ, I guess is the name of it. Um, that movie ended with uh, uh, the, the empty tomb, but it didn't really explain any further their tomb was empty but uh, this the resurrection of Jesus it was something I was hoping that they would do a movie on this subject and then happily uh, I guess about I think it was April of 2015 uh, I saw the movie Risen and I was thrilled I just I thought this is one of the greatest one of the most important movies ever made and I was disappointed that uh, most people I know have never seen it. Uh, so I've been encouraging people to see the movie. And I wanted to do a, a Google Hangout, uh, have a, a group of panelists discussing the movie. Uh, but I couldn't find other people who'd actually seen the movie. And, uh, was, and now with Google Hangouts, uh, the, I don't have the technical ability to do those any longer, I guess. So um, I'm going to do this review of the movie Risen myself, and I, I had the opportunity to see it again a few days ago, or a week or two ago, because now it's available free uh, on demand on my uh, cable. Uh, so I watched it again, and this time I took careful notes. Um, here are my notes. There's one, two, almost three pages here of, of notes. Um, and so I'm going to go through this. Um, I'm sorry if, uh, I know some people like to have shorter videos, and it is my intention to do a lot of very short videos. I probably will be doing like a short video, a video that's maybe five to ten minutes long. I plan on doing those almost daily, but today th this subject cannot be done in five or ten minutes. It's going to take uh, a while to review this movie. So I'm going to start from the very beginning. Um, uh, the The name of the company that made it is Affirm Films. 
it's a Sony company. Now, I don't know any relevance of that, but I thought you might want to know. Uh, and it is nice that uh, a company like Sony and, and a lot of companies now are actually making movies, uh, talking about the Bible and the Bible subject matter and, and Jesus. And uh, So uh, I'm glad they're doing it, even though almost all of them have um, not been historically correct or they've been wrong, bad in one way or another. But at least uh, one thing that comes out of it is that sometimes it um, it is the stimulus that causes people to say, well, hey, maybe I'll look at the Bible. In fact, that's how I got saved. In fact, uh, tomorrow will be my 30th anniversary of my new birth, uh, 30 years as a Christian. Uh, I'm going to make a video about that So tomorrow. But uh, what uh, one of the reasons that I did start reading the Bible and got saved was because I watched the movie Jesus of Nazareth and it said at the end of the movie for more information read the Bible so I read my Bible for 30 years studying it and teaching it now and uh, I found the truth in the Bible and put my faith in our great Savior God Jesus and my life has never been the same uh, so um, the one thing that can come out of these movies is sometimes, even if the movie, movie isn't perfect, it uh, stimulates an interest for people to read the Bible. So now back to the movie The Risen. Uh, the, the main character of the movie uh, is a, a man named uh, Cla Clavi Clavi Clavius. I thought it was Claudius, but I think it's Clavius. Uh, and... Um, he is the tribune uh, who I assume the, the relationship between a tribune and the, the governor, Pontius, uh, um, Pontius Pilate, uh, is that the tribune is the next level below the governor. He's kind of like a, a president and a vice president. He, he, he's that high in his stature, stature and power. So the main character is the tribune, holds the office just below the, uh, Pontius Pilate, and uh, Pontius Pilate is uh, another one of the main characters uh, in this movie. But uh, this tribune, Clavius, is, uh, he's been, it starts off with him uh, in these wars because he's leading the, the army against all these uh, uprisings, these rebellions, uh, primarily from uh, the, the Jews who re resisting uh, Roman occupation. So it starts off. He's this successful, you know, like general. Um, and uh, so, now the point of the movie early on is that uh, the wor there's a worry that this um, um, promised Messiah that the Jews believe in is uh, going to uh, cause an uprising and... Uh, rebel against Roman occupation. So they have, Rome, I guess, has been kind of preoccupied with this thought and, and, and uh, always looking for anybody who may be this Messiah or claim to be a Messiah who's going to lead a rebellion against Rome. So it's something that is, uh, the Roman authorities are aware of in uh, the, that the Jewish people believe in. A, a Messiah would come, rescue them from Roman occupation. Um, it, so it starts off where uh, Clavius is sent by Pontius Pilate. He's told uh, that, hey, I just, uh, there was this person I just tried, and he's, now I ordered him to be crucified, and uh, go out there and, and uh, make sure it's, uh, it's uh, done correctly and completed. And uh, so right away that... Uh, Pontius Pilate is expressing kind of mixed feelings about it. He felt he had to do it for political reasons. Uh, there's no way around it. And yet, you know, he felt he was an innocent person. Jesus was an innocent person. So he sent Clavius off to the crucifixion site. And uh, when Clavius arrives, Jesus is already uh, dead on the cross. Um, so... The, the, uh, the interesting thing is that 
there's so many interesting things about this movie. You know, when I, I'm very concerned about movies uh, um, being biblically correct, not contradicting what we find in the scriptures, and also being historically correct in terms of uh, showing things as they actually were at that time and place in history. And it was interesting, uh, the actual mechanical um, uh, structure of the cross, the crucifixion, um, in, in this movie, it, uh, it was really very me mechanically designed so that they could, um, it was almost like a catapult type of a situation where it had a base and, it, and uh, it, through, through um, uh, levers they can raise it up and hold, and hold it up and then, and then pull this, a pin out and it just falls flat on the ground. And it was really interesting, the, um, the mechanical design of the cross, of the, the apparatus, the structure, the base of the cross. But um, So at this point, Jesus is deceased, and uh, they were surprised because he's only been on the cross for a few hours, and sometimes it takes days for people to slowly suffer and die on the cross. Uh, so it's a surprise that he's already deceased, and the um, criminals, the one on each side of Jesus that we read about in the scriptures, um, they're alive. Um, but Clavius is sent there to finish up this task, and, and so he orders the legs to be broken of the criminals, the thieves on the cross on either side of Jesus. See, when you break their legs, they cannot push themselves up uh, in, in, in position so they can gasp for air. See, when, when people die on the cross from crucifixion, what normally kills them is uh, suffocation. See, the, it, the word crucifixion um, comes from the word excruciate, excruciating pain. Uh, the, the most horrible pain is described as being excruciating. So um, it's an agonizing way to, to, to be executed. Um, your the, the arms are wrist appears between the radius and the ulna bone here, and there's a nerve there that's particularly uh, you know, prone to, to pain, and that's right where the nail goes through. And so that, and then also in the feet, you have these piercings, and a person is held upon that, pinned upon that cross, nailed to the cross. But uh, it's agonizing. But what's really agonizing is the fact that to catch a breath, you cannot just hang because you can't get air in your lungs. You have to pull up with your arms and push up with your feet to raise yourself up and gasp for air. And this is a Every breath of air is an agonizing, excruciating, uh, painful experience until the person no longer has the strength and you know, can uh, raise themselves up and then they die from suffocation. But that process is agonizing, excruciating for sometimes uh, a day or two. But to cause these thieves to die quickly, they're ordered, it's a uh, typical procedure that they want them to die right away rather than waiting any longer they will the soldier will break their legs and uh, now the scriptures say that uh, in the, the prophecies that were written about Jesus uh, in uh, Psalms a thousand years before Jesus and uh, in um, Isaiah 700 years before Jesus there's clear descriptions of this whole um, this Messiah, all the details about him and his death, and uh, even details about how he would die. Uh, interestingly enough, crucifixion hadn't even been invented and used at the time that those scriptures were written in Isaiah and Psalms. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, it could it could it could only be described in crucifixion. Um, so the. Um, the prophecies say that not one bone of the Messiah would be broken. And so, obviously, if Jesus was alive at this point, and when they were ordered to break their legs, 
then uh, you know that prophecy would have been false because they would have broken the legs of Jesus just as they broke the legs of the thieves. But they, uh, since Jesus was dead, there was no reason to break his legs. But they did break the legs of the thieves. That uh, caused this, the thieves to die very quickly. But with Jesus, he was dead, but uh, to be certain that he was actually dead, uh, it was ordered to thrust a spear through his side, and that's also uh, prophesied in the scripture and described. So uh, it's all uh, biblically correct, and uh, there's, uh, it's, it's portrayed in, in great detail and accurately. Um, now, at the same time, uh, the scriptures tell us that uh, there is an earthquake that happens at the time of Jesus' death in the temple. Uh, there's a curtain that separates the outer area for the public from the private area where only the high priest can go once a year. And, and um, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this um, curtain uh, is symbolic of the uh, separation between man and God because of man's sin. Man is alienated, separated from God. Uh, and uh, so that, that curtain was torn. Now in the movie they didn't show the curtain being torn, but they did portray the uh, in Jerusalem a, a, a very large destructive uh, earthquake that happened at the time that Jesus died. So that is a part of the, it also conforms with what the scriptures say. Um, now, uh, and of course there's one of the soldiers as he's witnessing uh, the, as he, he was there witnessing Jesus' crucifixion, he declares that uh, this man was innocent. It wasn't Clavius that said that, but another soldier, so that's included in the movie. Uh, this was an innocent man. Um, then uh, Joseph of Arimathea, it doesn't say whose name, his name at that point, but uh, you know we know from the scriptures that's who it was. He comes with a letter uh, from Pontius Pilate uh, giving him permission to take the body. And this is very, very significant because um, um, the, the bodies of the thieves and all the other people who were crucified, uh, they're just thrown into a, a, like a dump, a garbage dump for bodies outside of Jerusalem called Gehenna, which is a lot of people interpret that word as being hell. <clears throat> but it's an actual location of a dump site for the bodies. So they, they show the, all these bodies in Gehenna being dumped there. And that's where Jesus' body would have been. There would have been no tomb and no resurrection from the tomb and uh, no stone rolled away. And all the things that did happen that we are, are described in the scriptures, that, that they would have been absolutely different if G, uh, Joseph of Arimathea hadn't got permission to get his body and put it in his, his tomb in the, the, the Joseph of Arimathea owned. Um, so that is really interesting how they show Gehenna and what happens to the bodies. And thank you, Jesus. Uh, so happy that he was spared that. And the, um, uh, and the, 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 the actor that is, uh, plays the part of Jesus in this, uh, he is not blonde-haired and blue-eyed as we get in Jesus of Nazareth and King of Kings and all these other movies in the past, the actors are, are they're all uh, uh, basically uh, uh, European type, uh, Aryan type, blue eyes. Well, G Jesus, uh, in this, uh, this actor is dark hair, or with dark, dark, little darker complexion, not African American, but Middle Eastern looking with a dark beard. A black beard. Um, the um, now uh, then, Pilate gives uh, is giving a recount of uh, the, the the trial and the argument for the um, um, not only that the Jews gave gave uh, against Jesus their charges against him, but also. Once the crucifixion had taken place, the, the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, uh, the, the religious leaders of the Jews, 
their argument to, to him saying, hey, uh, it's been, okay, he's dead, but there, he promised that he would raise himself from the dead on the third day. And so we want you to post guards, seal the tomb and post guards so that uh, this, uh, the body cannot be stolen. And because then uh, it'll be even worse than before because uh, if they claim that he, hey, he, he actually was raised from the dead. So they appealed to Pontius Pilate to uh, take measures against this. And... Um, now, also, uh, Clavius, um, he, he has a private conversations in, a, in like a Roman bath type of thing with uh, Pontius Pilate. And uh, uh, he's, of course, very ambitious. He's a tribune, so maybe he, can, he will end up being a governor. And he, it's his hope that he someday will advance even further, uh, be able to have this high position, make a lot of money, then buy some land and retire. And his end goal, his thoughts about all this, he says, is that um, that he would uh, have peace and no more death. So, um, of course, this is a private conversation between him and, and uh, Pontius Pilate. And then later on, of course, in the movie, uh, Jesus and his conversation with Clavius says that same thing to him and so it's another it's a sign to Clavius Jesus he's all knowing he knew about that even though he wasn't there uh, now so the Sanhedrin uh, they appealed to, to uh, Pontius Pilate to protect against the theft of the body and uh, they it's agreed that the tomb will be sealed and guards will be posted and the, the actual way that they sealed the tomb it was really really interesting uh, it had the Roman uh, like uh, wax or rubbery type of stamp with a Roman seal on it uh, it had that all over the stone now the stone was huge and you've seen it probably in other movies uh, it was like a size of a, um, a disc, I would say, but I mean, shaped like a disc. Um, and it would, it was probably about maybe, guessing maybe eight feet in diameter and maybe two feet in width, solid stone. And so it was very, very heavy and very large. And it had these Roman seals all over it and with ropes and and then the, the ropes were tied across it and the seals all over it. It was really very thoroughly sealed up, not just with one Roman seal, but probably looked like maybe 20 of them all over it. So they, they had really done a thorough job of sealing it. Not only I'm talking about sealing it, closing it up, but actually using the Roman seal. And if that Roman seal was broken, then it's a... If anybody disturbs the Roman seal, it's a, it's a capital crime, and they would be uh, executed. Um, so the the Jews, the Sanhedrin, uh, they before Jesus is uh, put in the tomb, the Sanhedrin is right there, and they inspect the tomb. And so you can see that they're very, very careful. They want to make sure that this tomb has no, uh, you know, there's no back door, or there's no other way. Uh, so, because they're very concerned about this uh, resurrection um, claimed by Jesus, and they really believe that someone's going to steal that body. So they inspect the, th the, the tomb very carefully. Um, and then, um, when the, the body's missing, uh, after the, uh, the resurrection, the guards, they they know immediately that uh, they're going to be blamed and held uh, res responsible for this and that the, the penalty for that will be execution. So they're afraid. So the guards go to the signed headroom and uh, they tell them they need sanctuary and the Sanhedrin agrees to give them sanctuary if they will tell a, a, a different account. Uh, uh, make up and tell the account that uh, the Sanhedrin makes up, and that is that they're um, 
G Jesus' disciples came, uh, overpowered them, and took, rolled a stone away and, and took Jesus' body. And, and uh, uh, they were outnumbered and overpowered. And, and uh, that's the story that they're told by the Sanhedrin that they must tell in order to get sanctuary. Um, now, um, so, but Pilate uh, then, uh, he, he decides that uh, the, if the body was stolen, it must have been stolen because they, they totally dismissed the possibility that there could actually be a resurrection, so obviously the body had to be stolen. So, uh, where is it? So the, the mission at this point becomes, let's find the body. And we must find a body. And not necessarily his body, but a body. Any body that will su uh, suffice so that they could claim that, the, hey, we found his body. It wasn't a resurrection. Uh, so that was very interesting that uh, they, they were ser searching for a body that will serve the purpose of... of uh, uh, laying the, the claim of a resurrection. Um, now, when the tomb is inspected, uh, after the resurrection, also you find there's the, the face cloth that, uh, you know, there you have a one face cloth uh, that uh, is part of Roman Catholic, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fable is the Veronica's faith face cloth where on the uh, on as Jesus is carrying his cro cross to uh, go to Golgotha for the, his, his uh, crucifixion he stumbles and this woman named Veronica wipes his face with a cloth and and then it turns out his has his his, his face is on the cloth not his face but it's like a picture of his face in the blood but another one is uh, we we know that uh, has the image of Jesus is the Shroud of Turin. And I, I watched a lot of documentaries, and there have been a lot of dark reason movies made about the Shroud of Turin. And I'm one of those that believes that um, it is the burial shroud of Jesus. And that during the resurrection, something happened where the body uh, passed through that cloth because it wasn't like the cloth was unwoven or removed from Jesus carefully because he's wrapped in it. It wasn't like it was taken away. It was like his body just disappeared and some kind of a, let's say, radioactive thing happened when the body disassembled itself and was taken right out of that burial cloth that the image of his body was left behind uh, on it. So that's, the, uh, that's what we believe about the Shroud of Turin. But um, um, so in the, in the burial, uh, in the tomb, after the resurrection, when they're inspecting the tomb, the Sanhedrin and uh, the, the Roman guards, they see this burial cloth. And they, that cloth is taken by you know, one of the Roman soldiers. Um, so this is all biblically correct and also extra biblical uh, things uh, that are, are written about those times. This movie is conforming to all that. Even things that are written uh, by the Jewish people, Jewish uh, people at that time, and and even more contemporary, that they they want to uh, their arguments that it wasn't a real resurrection, like making up the story that the body was stolen. Uh, there's other theories. Um, I have a playlist called uh, I think it's called. Uh, I don't know if it's resurrection or crucifixion or something, but it talks about the different theories about uh, was the body stolen? Was it uh, there's a swoon, th swoon where he wasn't really dead? And, and uh, it's interesting how uh, to discuss those as possibilities. For in, in my opinion, they're they're absolutely absurd, uh, you know, arguments. Uh, the uh, the only way of really explaining it uh, is to, uh, well, matter of fact, I remember now where I discussed that, and the playlist is the book More Than a Carpenter. I did a, a study of the book More Than a Carpenter, a video series on that. So you can watch that. Much of it is about the resurrection uh, and the, uh, the, the possible arguments saying that it wasn't really a resurrection. Here's, here's what really happened. So 
Uh, I don't want to go into that right now, but uh, that's the playlist that has that information on it. So um, they start inspecting all the bodies. The Clavius is, is heading up a group of soldiers, and they're going all over, looking through Go uh, Gehenna, looking at all the bodies, seeing if any of them are Jesus, or if any of them, even though it's not actually Jesus, that it could be uh, sold, it could represent it as Jesus' body. Even though they don't care that it's a fraud, a fraudulent claim, anybody that could be passed as possibly Jesus' body, they would be willing to use to quell this, uh, the claim of a resurrection. Um, now, the, the guards are interrogated by uh, uh, Pontius Pilate and by uh, Clavius, uh, but, you know, uh, somehow they were able to get sanctuary with the Sanhedrin, and um, they, uh, the, the, the interrogation of the guards is very, very interesting, too. Uh, finally, of course, uh, the guards end up confessing that their story was made up, and they were told to uh, by the Sanhedrin to make up this story, and they give the actual account of what really happened. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll come to that. Um, and also, all the followers, uh, anybody who was a disciple or follower of Jesus, these people are all mounted up too, and uh, uh, threatened with torture and death uh, if, if they don't say where the body is. Yeah, because they're convinced there's not a resurrection, so the body's got to be somewhere. And so they're trying to find out where it is and, and interrogating people and, and threatening uh, them with torture. Um, now, one of the uh, characters that is threatened is uh, Mary uh, Magdalene. And in, in this movie, Mary Magdalene is represented as a prostitute. And I know that uh, uh, many do people consider that the prostitute that Jesus uh, uh, saved from stoning when he said, uh, he who has no sin can cast the first stone, and they dropped their stones and, and she was spared, and he said, go and sin no more. Uh, by the way, that verse just doesn't mean be sinlessly perfect so you can be go to heaven. It, it means that don't continue in this prostitution or or else, you know, you'll be back in the same situation again or maybe worse will happen and they'll actually stone you next time. So that's why she's told to go and sin no more regarding the prostitution. Um, but the Bible does not actually, uh, there's no way of concluding that this prostitute is Mary Magdalene. Uh, a lot of people believe that is the case, but I, I mean, it is possible. Maybe she, Mary Magdalene, was the prostitute, uh, but uh, I cannot, I cannot conclude that based upon the scriptures. It doesn't really say one way or the other. But in the movie, uh, they represent her as a prostitute, and they're searching for her um, because she's known as a, a disciple of Jesus. And when they uh, um, to find her. They, they find a soldier that, quote, knew her, but knew her in a sexual way and could recognize and identify her. So they find this soldier, and uh, he says, well, let's see if anybody knows where she is. And they go into like a garrison full of probably 50 soldiers. And they say, they say they're looking for her. Uh, has anybody uh, known her? Has anybody been one of their customers? And out of 50 soldiers, almost all of them raised their hand, yes, yes. So it was kind of a, a humorous way of expressing that, hey, yeah, they, uh, she was a very busy prostitute, and all the soldiers uh, were customers of hers. Uh, so that's how they portrayed Mary Magdalene uh, initially. But then, of course, and once you meet Mary Magdalene, and you, uh, she's very, very impressive, her, her, her faith and, and is, uh, um, I think it's very well done, and, and you know, very, she's very admired. I think you will end up admiring her from the, the way she's portrayed in the movie. Um, 
So, um, Pilate says also at one point that uh, Caesar's spies will hear of this. And hear of this means that this, uh, there was this claim that this Jesus was a Messiah. He had to be executed. Uh, and, uh, and now there's a claim that he's, there's a resurrection and he's alive again. And, and, but they can't find the body. And it's like a big, um, a horrible situation politically for Pontius Pilate, and he's worried that the spies will will uh, get, this will all get back to to Caesar um, because the spies are going to inform on him. So he's very very worried and very very afraid what's uh, going to happen to him. So so um, Bartholomew is uh, found. And he's being interrogated and threatened with torture. And he, uh, uh, he, for the first time in the movie, we hear from Bartholomew that what Jesus taught, and, and it was that eternal life for everyone who believes in Jesus for it. So there you have the salvation message that every person, without exception, it doesn't matter. Uh, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, uh, you know, any person, whosoever, who believes in Jesus uh, for their salvation, believes that Jesus is God who became a man, who died on that cross and in dying paid for all their sins and now the sin problem between man and God is resolved and now they can actually go to heaven because of what Jesus did for them, paying for their sins. If this is what we believe, this is the gospel, and then uh, so from Timotheus, uh, I mean Bar from Bartholomew, we hear this uh, explanation that this is what Jesus taught. He wasn't a rebel. He wasn't teaching that let's rebel against Rome. He was teaching eternal life for everyone, anyone, without exception, who believes in him for it. Uh, and then um, uh, it, does, it does explain the agony. There's a discussion about the crucifixion and, and how the agony that people go through uh, uh, during a crucifixion. And that... Uh, so the question is asked, how could this huge stone that is, um, uh, it could be end up 10 feet away from the tomb itself? Uh, and they said it, it took the soldiers, uh, seven soldiers, in order to move it at all. And so um, they're trying to figure out how this crime, this theft of his body, could have possibly happened, and it's just not all adding up from like an investigative detective, uh, you know, uh, viewpoint. And so Clavius, in his uh, attempt to find out what actually happened, it's just not making sense uh, as, as far as the story that that he was told from the guards. And that so Clavius does get the true account from the guard, actually what did happen, and that is that uh, there was this uh, great. Uh, blinding light and this, this sound and this terrifying sound and, and, and the, it doesn't go into great detail about what happened but it was a very frightful experience for them and they uh, uh, they I don't remember exactly if they actually said they saw Jesus leave the tomb or not so forgive me on that I, don't, I didn't make a note on that um, but they give an account of the truth that the body was not stolen that uh, the uh, angels, I think. I think they said angels are some kind of powerful beings, uh, entities were were there, and they were afraid, very much afraid. Uh, so Clavius, he finds the he finally finds all the apostles. It's in this great search for the, where are they hiding, and the, he has spies, and he's bribing people and threatening people, and finally someone tell, tells him where they are, and so he finally. Finally, finds the apostles clustered in a room, and he goes in there, and Jesus is in the room with the apostles. And Clavius sees Jesus, and he recognized him because he was at the crucifixion. He knew what Jesus looked like, and it's Jesus. 
And then this is and this is the scene. Clavius is there. Of course, this is the fictional part of it. Uh, Clavius is actually a fictional character, but um, in in this movie, Clavius is in the room when Jesus is there, and then uh, Thomas enters the room, and he embraces Jesus. And that the, the scene is the the account we, in the scriptures where. Jesus says, put your fingers into my wounds, and he believes, and he had previously doubted the resurrection, but now he believes. And so that uh, account of doubting Thomas is what's happening, and Clavius is in the room witnessing it all. So there's no way around it. Clavius knows that the body was not stolen, there is a resurrection, and then Clavius' life could not be the same after that. He ends up writing a letter, kind of a resignation, or saying, don't look for me, and leaves it. And he ends up going with G Jesus, and, and Jesus basically, at that moment, he disappears. It's just, and, and everybody's in shock, because he's there in the flesh, he's eating with them, they're talking, touching him, examining him, and it's clear that he's, uh, it's a bodily resurrection, it's not just some kind of a, a vision, or a uh, dream. And uh, Clavius knows that that's the case and there's no way around it. And, and then Jesus just disappears. And he's, and the scriptures tell us that he appears in a room and then disappears. Uh, this happens numerous times. Uh, but Clavius now, he's a believer in the resurrection at least. And so now he, he, he leaves his uh, tribune position and his life behind and he goes and starts following the living with the apostles uh, for the remainder of the movie and having some, the rest of the movies about that. Um, uh, so, uh, now, so while Clavius, and once Pontius Pilate uh, becomes aware that Clavius has left, and now he becomes a wanted man. And uh, so now they're all out trying to find uh, not only the the apostles, uh, but also find Clavius. Um, and so Clavius, he, he queries Peter. He asks Peter a lot of like theological type of questions. And Peter, is, he answers them the best he can, but he admits, I don't have all the answers. I don't understand it all myself. Uh, but uh, Clavius is seeking answers for all this now, trying to understand what's happening. And they're at, now they're at the Sea of Galilee, and it's the scene where the uh, the miracle of the fishes, where they're fishing all night and they catch nothing, and and uh, Clavius is in the boat with all the apostles while they're fishing, and they're waiting for Jesus because they were told to wait for him in Galilee, um, and uh, they're hungry, and then all night long they don't catch anything, and then uh, sun comes up and someone's on the beach. They don't recognize it. it's Jesus, but he says, how's the fishing? And he will catch your, cast your net on the right side or left side, whatever side he told them, and they cast their net there, and and they, they the boat almost sinks as they're trying to pull up all the fishes. I think the scriptures say there's 154 fishes in that catch, and it's huge. And, of course, they know then this is a, another example of, it's another miracle. They didn't know it was Jesus who told them, but they had to be Jesus. And so they go back and they have this cookout. And they cook fish and um, they have this time with Jesus and Clavius is there with them. And uh, there was also a leper that come uh, on the scene at that time. And Jesus heals the leper. And uh, so that's another t time where I think it's uh, 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 Bartholomew again who is uh, telling, he's been trying to explain everything to uh, Clavius, and it's, it's hard to explain everything, but when he, now he, when Jesus is there and heals the leper, Bartholomew says, see, I mean, I, seeing is believing. Now you know, you know, well, uh, it's the miracles that Jesus did that uh, were the signs uh, to, to prove that who he was. So the, there was a purpose for all these signs. Jesus healed people not just because he loved them and wanted to heal them, but also as uh, signs proving that he does have uh, this power because he is God manifest in the flesh. 
Um, and then also the scene, the, the same thing happens where he, Jesus is talking uh, to Simon privately and he asks him, Simon, do you love me? And he, and the feed my, he says, yes, we'll feed my sheep. And now, oh, he, he, so it turns out that Jesus has asked Simon three times, do you love me? Oh, over and over again. Simon keeps saying yes. He knows, so why is he asking three times? And it's always been my belief that he asked him three times to um, make him, or to connect it to the fact that um, Peter had denied Jesus three times at the night of Jesus' arrest. He didn't, he, Jesus said, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And sure enough, Simon Peter did deny him three times. So now he answers this question, do you love me three times from Jesus? Um, um, Uh, so uh, now there's, there's a, um, also a moment where everybody's sleeping and, and Clavius wakes up and he sees that Jesus is in prayer on this uh, high point of the, like a hill and uh, actually a mountaintop and Clavius joins him and he has this private talk with Jesus and he, he, he knows that uh, now he's convinced about who Jesus is, but he, he says, I, I need to talk to you about I, I He says, I don't even know what to ask. I don't know where to begin. Uh, and Jesus said, speak your heart. And then during this conversation, things come out that uh, uh, Jesus would not know, like this conversation that Clavius had with Pontius Pilate in the Roman bath that I mentioned earlier. This is a time when Jesus uh, uh, explain uh, as talks about that, and he wasn't there. So, these are the ways that you know that the, uh, many different times you can see how Jesus is proving his identity. Uh, and this is uh, and, and at the time also where he says to Clavius, uh, there 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 will be a day without death, because this is what. Clavius said earlier in the show that that was his dream, that he would retire someday, and because he, as a soldier and being in war, he was just constantly killing. And he did, he did it because it was his job and it was his duty to quell these rebellions. But he didn't want to kill. He just he was sick of death. And, and so and he said it was his dream to someday retire and have no more death, and that Jesus says the same thing to him there will be no more death. And he's talking about the um, uh, after the resurrection of, of mankind and the judgment and the new heavens and the new earth, the scripture says there will be no more death or sorrow or tears. And then at this point, the ascension happens and Jesus, is, it's almost like Jesus is there and there's like an explosion in, in, of light and he's, he, he, he goes up and disappears. It's an interesting portrayal of the ascension. Uh, and then you see the apostles begin their evangelism, and they're traveling around telling everybody about the, you know, the, the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, and they're, they're telling everybody. And, and it's interesting because my experience in years as a street preacher, a lot of times, and, and we're witnessing to, to people, um, we, we come up with a really good way of explaining something, or a good way of answering a question, and then we turn to each other, the street preachers, and say, wow, that was a good one. I'm going to have to use that one. And that, that very type of scenario happens while the apostles are doing their evangelism. One turns to the other, oh, he says, um, uh, uh, that's... Uh, Yeah, it's like it's, it's it's like they're the street preaching that they're doing is it reminds me of the street preaching that uh, that I had done, and, and the relationship between the street preachers where you share each other's experiences and you try to help each other learn different ways of answering questions. That was very interesting to me. Uh, and then the movie uh, ends where it begins, where uh, it's like it's, the movie starts off with uh, Clavius. 
uh, by himself wandering and he comes into this man's house and he's given something to eat and, and then it's like a flashback of all these things and now uh, now he's back in the man's house uh, at the end of the movie. So the, the movie is just uh, uh, his thoughts and his recount of all of this and at this point he he pays the man with his Tribune ring, so that's the last thing of, of that he's leaving behind. And uh, and then the man that uh, Clavius had, I guess, told the story to, uh, says, do you truly believe all this? And uh, Clavius says, I believe, um, and I could never be the same again. So that's how the movie ends. Uh, I highly recommend the movie. I, I assume that it's uh, available wherever you are now because now uh, you used to have to buy it or rent it, but uh, on my cable subscription uh, it's available free now. So I hope you will, no matter what you have to do, watch this movie uh, and, and I encourage other people to watch the movie because it really does give us a really wonderful historical account accurately of all the historical records of the times, exactly the way things were done. Uh, I found it particularly interesting how they uh, were searching for the bodies and they went through all these bodies at Gehenna. And, and um, there's so many things, details, a lot of great details in it. Uh, it's biblically correct, historically correct, and not only do we understand that Jesus is our Savior God, uh, and there was a death, burial, and resurrection. But unlike the movie Son of God, this movie tells us the point of his death, burial, and resurrection, and that by believing that we have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, well, I, I know I've gone on and on, but uh, as I said, I'm going to go on a crusade now to make a whole bunch of very short videos. So thanks for putting up with this long one. I look forward to your comments. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.